Today I'm going to walk you through the most relevant federal and Virginia state laws regarding water quality on concentrated animal feeding operations. My goal is for you to understand why and how water quality is regulated, to understand what getting a water quality permit might involve for a farm, to talk about who is required to have a permit, and also to talk about why you might want to get a water quality permit for your farm, even if you're not required to. So why do we regulate water quality? Well, quality water is a public good. Water is a public resource. And to be honest, most businesses of any kind don't have an economic incentive to protect the quality of the water near or leaving their area of business. It was really in the 1960s that the problems with the nation's water quality really began to get a lot of attention. And the major federal legislation that underlies all of our water quality rules today was the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, later updated and titled the Clean Water Act. And here's the gist of the Clean Water Act. You don't have a right to pollute. We do not have a right to discharge pollutants into navigable waters. Therefore, all facilities which discharge pollutants from any, any point source into waters of the United States are required to obtain an NPDES permit, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. I'll come back to that acronym later. But I've highlighted here some of the keywords, pollutants, point source, and waters of the United States. The first of those key terms is point source. So what's a point source? Well, here is exactly the legal language and then also a couple of photos that are maybe more clear. A point source is any discernible, confined, and discrete conveyance, including but not limited to pipes, ditches, channels, tunnels, conduits, wells, discrete fissures, containers, rolling stock, concentrated animal feeding operations, or a vessel or a floating craft from which pollutants are or may be discharged. It's the inclusion of concentrated animal feeding operations in this definition that's driving today's lecture. Equally important to being able to identify a point source is to know what is not a point source. A non-point source NPS pollution is any source that isn't declared a point source in the Clean Water Act. And this is really important in practice because the Clean Water Act does not require regulatory control of discharges from non-point sources of pollution. So you can imagine that there's been a great deal of legal activity, especially in the last decade, to really get the courts to parse this definition and to be very clear and explicit about who is a point source and therefore required to get an NPDES permit and who is not a point source. Non-point source pollution is usually addressed at the state level with voluntary means, best management practices, education, that sort of thing. The second of the key phrases was waters of the United States. Remember, we don't have the right to discharge into waters of the United States. So what's the definition of that? Number one, is it navigable? Can you put a boat in it? Number two, does it cross state lines? Also, intrastate waters, so waters entirely within the boundaries of a state, are considered a water of the United States if they are used by interstate travelers, if they are a source of fish or shellfish that's sold interstate, if they are used for industrial purposes by companies engaged in interstate commerce. And then here's the kicker. Or if they are connected to a stream that in and of itself is not navigable and is not interstate and is not used for interstate commerce can still be considered a water of the United States if it is connected to something that is navigable and interstate by any of these definitions. So navigable, interstate, involved in interstate commerce, or connected to those things. The third key term in the text from the Clean Water Act is pollutant. And there are a variety of categories of pollutants. This is important because if it's something is defined as a pollutant, then we're obligated to keep the waters clean of that pollutant. The ones that are relevant to farms might be total suspended solids. That's a measure of uh, soil runoff, uh, organic matter. Fecal coliforms, ammonia, nitrogen, phosphorus, and also some toxic pollutants. So if you think about the scope and the impact of the Clean Water Act, it does beg the question, who was it who signed this radical environmental legislation into law? It was Richard Nixon. And I'll let you look up whether he was a Democrat or a Republican. Your first assumption might be wrong. So that gives you some background as to why we regulate water quality. Now let's talk about how. At a federal level, from a federal perspective, there are four general approaches to water quality regulation. 
The first is applicable to non-agricultural point sources. And so this is things like factories and wastewater treatment plants. The requirement for them is to use the best available technology, use this technology, treat your discharge, and then you're legal. And so when you see discharge coming out of wastewater treatment plants or factories, a lot of time we look at it and say, well, that's not fair. How come they're allowed to pollute? Well, within very tight constraints, they are allowed to discharge, but they have to use the best available technology, which changes all the time. They have to test that discharge. They have to monitor the variety of pollutants, and they have to report. For example, a wastewater treatment plant has to do this testing and reporting monthly and submit those reports to the government. There was a case recently where a company was found in violation because mysteriously the concentrations of some of these pollutants were exactly the same month after month after month the regulators got a little bit suspicious that maybe the guy who was supposed to be doing the monitoring just got lazy and and copied and pasted. So the use the best available technology, discharge, monitor, and report approach, that's applicable to non-agricultural point sources. Moving past that, there are three general approaches that are relevant to agriculture. Of those, the one we're going to talk most about today is a no-discharge permit, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You have a permit, and the conditions of the permit require that there is no discharge. These permits often call for inspection and storage, and again, no discharge is allowed. The next applies to farms that, for a variety of reasons, are not required to get a permit, and I'll call this voluntary but... What I'm talking about is implementation of best management practices, voluntary implementation, cost-shared implementation. That's called voluntary but, because there is a fallback, and that's this fourth general approach. TMDL, total maximum daily loads. That will be the subject of an entire session later on in the semester, but we'll call that one when all else fails. Everybody's got to do more. So if the factories are using the best available technology and the farms that are required to have permits are have their no discharge permits and all the other farms are implementing best management practices. But the Clean Water Act says if the water is still not clean enough, we've got to do more. Let's drop back and do some more definitions. You remember that the Clean Water Act defines a concentrated animal feeding operation as a point source. You also remember that the Clean Water Act requires federal regulation of point source discharges, but does not require federal regulation of non-point source discharges. So this distinction, what farms are concentrated animal feeding operations and which farms are not, is really, really important. And so because the federal government likes to make things complicated, I have to start by defining an animal feeding operation. Think of this as anything that you would probably recognize as a working farm. An animal feeding operation is a lot or facility where the animals have been, are, or will be stabled, confined, and fed and maintained for a total of 45 days or more in any 12-month period. Okay, so stabled or confined means if you bring them in somewhere where there is no vegetation, say into a milking parlor, say into a feeding lot, if you bring them into that kind of an area for 45 days or more in a 12-month period, those animals are confined. And if they're confined, then the farm is an animal feeding operation. By definition, a dairy farm is always an animal feeding operation because cows are brought in daily to be milked for at least 45 days or more in any 12-month period. Whether or not a cow-calf operation would be considered an animal feeding operation depends on its management. If there is an area that it, where you're bringing the cows in to feed them for 45 days or more in a 12-month period of time, and that area is either concrete or bare, denuded of vegetation, then yes, that farm meets the definition of confinement. They are an animal feeding operation. Animal f- So that's step one. I have a farm with some animals and I need to decide if it's an animal feeding operation. And you figure that out by that confinement definition on the previous page. Now that you've decided that, yeah, I I do have an animal feeding operation, the critical question is, would it be viewed as a concentrated animal feeding operation? There are a variety of criteria that are going to come into this, but a key one is where does your water go? If you are discharging pollutants from your animal feeding operation, you're going to be defined or designated as a concentrated animal feeding operation. 
Your animal feeding operation can be declared a CAFO two ways. First is just by federal definition. And a federal definition basically comes down to size and discharging. So large AFOs who are discharging, they are by definition a CAFO. But the feds also have designation authority. So an AFO of any size that is discharging can be designated a CAFO. So you see the emphasis on discharging. Again, that question, where does your water go? Make sure you keep these acronyms straight. AFO is Animal Feeding Operation, and that is any farm that is confining animals 45 days or more. Then among those AFOs, and there's about 450,000 AFOs in the United States, there are CAFOs defined or designated. There are about 20,000 CAFOs in the United States. These CAFOs may be large, medium, or small. Large CAFOs are defined by size and by discharge. The fact of the matter is, if you're a large farm, you're going to be subject to greater scrutiny. So how big is big? A large CAFO is 1,000 or more head of beef cattle, 700 head or more mature dairy cattle, 55,000 or more turkeys, 30,000 or more laying hens. It's easy to find the table on the EPA website or whatever your state regulatory agency is with these size cutoffs. A medium-sized animal feeding operation can be defined as a CAFO by a combination of size and discharge criteria. So the size would be for beef cattle between 300 and 1,000 head, for dairy cattle between 200 and 700 confined mature dairy cattle, these would be medium-sized animal feeding operations, and they are CAFOs if there is a ditch, a pipe, a man-made conveyance that's discharging into surface water, or if this medium-sized AFO allows their cattle access to the streams. Even a small farm that confines its animals, a small AFO, can be designated a CAFO if it has at least one of those discharge criteria, pipe, some specific place where it's clearly discharging pollutants into surface water, and if the pollution is pretty egregious, if they are seen as a significant contributor of pollution. So any farm that is defined or designated as a CAFO is required by the Clean Water Act to get an NPDES permit or its state equivalent. So what's involved in getting a permit? The first thing to know is that these are no discharge permits. These are permits that when followed will result in no discharge from the farm. This is distinctly different from the discharge permits offered to wastewater treatment plants. That raises a basic question of fairness. People say, well, why can they discharge and farms cannot? The short answer is because with a wastewater treatment plant or a, or a business, we can go to the pipe, we can sample that discharge, we can measure the quantity of that discharge, and we can know exactly how much pollutant is being dumped into the stream, and we can tighten down on that. With farms, there is no way to do that. The sources are so diffuse. Sources of discharge might be runoff from a field, might be from a ditch, might be runoff from a feed area. There's no one discrete place that we can go and measure and analyze. And so for that reason, permits for farms are no discharge permits. These typically include things like a nutrient management plan. This is mandatory, and when, the, when a nutrient management plan is part of a permit, it is legally enforceable. The nutrient management plan is going to dictate things like how much manure storage you have so as to prevent land application on frozen or saturated ground. The nutrient management plan will be written for a certain number of animals, and if you're permitted, you can't grow beyond that without permission. Sometimes, but not always, water quality monitoring is required as part of a permit. Also, permits require periodic training of the farmer and his staff, regular inspections, often these would be annual, and a great deal of, of record keeping. The Clean Water Act allows states to take over this responsibility of regulating point sources, as long as the standards of the state are at least as stringent as the federal standards. Most states have taken on this responsibility. 46 of the 50 run their own point source permit programs. And in most of those states, the bar is set a bit higher, a bit more strict than the federal standards. Like most states, Virginia does set the bar higher. In Virginia, all large and medium-sized animal feeding operations are considered CAFOs. Virginia issues two different permit types for CAFOs, for point sources. The one is the Virginia version of the federal. This is the Virginia Pollution Discharge Elimination System. 
The other is the Virginia Pollution Abatement Permit. And most CAFOs in Virginia opt for the state permit, the VPA permit, versus the Virginia version of the NPDES permit. The elements of a VPA permit are pretty standard. Again, it is a no point source discharge permit. It requires that the farmer follow the nutrient management plan, monitor and maintain records on things like soil nutrient composition, manure nutrient composition, manure volumes throughout the year, manure applications to specific fields. These VPA permits are 10 years in duration, and the basic bones of a VPA permit are the same for all farms. It is the nutrient management plan that makes them farm specific. As mentioned, Virginia does set the bar higher compared to the federal cutoffs in terms of who is required to obtain a permit. In this table are the minimums. So if you have 200 or more confined mature dairy cattle in Virginia, you're required to have a permit. That number would be 300 or more confined beef cattle. And you see the numbers for turkeys, broilers, swine. You can find data on whatever your species of interest. There are some advantages to obtaining a permit, and we'll talk about those later. But some would look at this table and start trying to figure out how close they can come to the limit without being required to have a permit. So some obvious questions. I own two dairy farms with 199 cows on each. I have 199 lactating cows and 30 dry cows. And then the ever popular, okay, I'm required to, but I don't want to. What's the worst they can do to me? Let's talk through these in the next few slides. So let's play a game of who's who. I'm going to give you various scenarios, and I want you to think about and try to figure out whether or not this is a farm that is required to obtain a VPA permit. So first of all, I have 190 milking cows. I have 30 dry cows in the dry cow barn, and I have a liquid manure pit. Yes or no? The answer is yes. This is a herd that will obtain a VPA permit because the combined number of confined mature dairy animals is 220. 190 milking cows, by definition milking cows are confined because they have to be milked, and 30 dry cows who are housed in a dry cow barn. So again, those animals are confined. You're greater than 200 mature dairy cows confined, yes, you're a VPA permit herd. Here's another for you, 190 milking cows and 30 dry cows, they live on pasture. I have a liquid manure storage pit. Is this a VPA herd, yes or no? In this case, no, because there are 190 confined mature dairy animals. In most instances, those 30 dry cows housed on pasture are not going to be considered confined. Now, if housed on pasture means they have a lot that they exercise in, but, but they have to come over to the fence line feeder every day to receive grain, that's different. Now, they are considered confined. The type of manure storage is a red herring. It, it's not a factor that comes into play. The important element is the number of confined animals. So here's a more diversified farm. They're milking 150 cows. They have 40 breeding age heifers that are confined in a barn at any one time. They also have a small feedlot. They have 50 beef feeder steers. All manure is stored in a dry stack shed. So yes or no, is this a VPA permit herd? This is a bit more tricky, and your nutrient management planner will help you do the math, but the answer to this is yes. If you add up 150 mature dairy cows and 40 confined breeding age heifers and 50 beef feedlot steers, the combined weight of those animals is going to tip them over the edge. And this is because the calculation of minimum animal numbers is based on an assumed animal body weight. We call a 1,000 pounds of creature an animal unit. And we assume things like every dairy heifer that is more than a year of age weighs 1,000 pounds. Beef animals over a year of age weigh 1,000 pounds. Mature dairy cattle, we assume that they're Holsteins and that they weigh 1,400 pounds. So those are the assumptions that go into driving those minimum numbers. I'm not going to actually expect you to do that math. But if you see something like this that is very close to the edge on one species and then they have a significant number of another species, the answer is probably going to be yes. They are going to need to get a VPA permit. For our last example today, let's look at the other end of the spectrum, a very small farm with 60 milking cows, but several places on the farm where it's obvious that there is water in contact with manure that is flowing to a stream. So take a look at the photo. You can see that there's a little channel running through a manured area and that following that channel down the hill, it's ultimately leading to a stream. And the farmer is saying, no, I'm small. I don't have to get a permit. You can't make me. So what do you think? Is this a VPA permit herd or not? The answer is no, but. 
if you're discharging, as is clearly happening in that photo, and you won't fix it, you can be designated a CAFO and required to fix it. If this farmer said, well, what's the worst you can do to me? In Virginia, a violation of a VPA permit is $2,500 per violation, and each day is considered a new violation. If the farmer were really to push it and resist that, they can be bumped into the federal system, and the penalty for violating a VPDES permit is $30,000 per violation. Each day of discharging is a separate and distinct violation. So just fix it. The standard VPA permit doesn't apply to broiler and turkey operations because of a detail to do with the dry manure versus liquid waste, but there is, of course, a separate permit program specifically for large poultry operations in Virginia. Under this statute, any turkey farm with more than 11,000 birds at any one time, any broiler operation with more than 20,000 birds at any one time is required to get a permit. There is a requirement for on-site manure storage. We'll talk more about how manure is managed on these farms later in the semester, but the short version is often they are cleaned out five or six times a year, resulting in a large pile of poultry litter. The permit requires on-site storage so that that poultry litter will not be stored uncovered for more than two weeks. In most cases, that litter, the waste, is being transferred off-farm, usually through a litter broker, sometimes directly to an end user. The permit program requires that these transfers are tracked, that a nutrient analysis and fact sheet are transferred along with the litter to the end user. There are application limits and a great deal of record keeping involved. There have been a number of lawsuits in recent years challenging whether CAFOs can be required to obtain a permit just because they are big. The courts have ruled that the duty to apply for a permit cannot be based just on size, but rather that a discharge must exist before a farm can be required to obtain a permit. But this is a catch-22. It is still illegal for CAFOs to discharge to the waters of the United States. There are many situations in which a CAFO that does not normally discharge would do so, and at that point they'd be in violation of the Clean Water Act. For instance, if there's a very large rain event and a discharge occurs, farms that have a permit and are abiding by the permit conditions are protected. If you are a CAFO, you don't have a permit because you believe you're not discharging, and then you discharge because of a very large rain event, you're not protected. CAFOs are point sources, and and it's illegal for point sources to discharge, period. In that same series of lawsuits, the courts ruled that a nutrient management plan must be submitted with the permit application, that this is a matter of public record, that it is an enforceable component of the permit. Farm groups had fought this because a nutrient management plan contains a great deal of farm-specific information, but the courts have ruled that that must be included with the permit application, and it is subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. It is an enforceable part of the permit. Earlier, I alluded to the fact that farms that are close to the cutoff or even farms that are clearly smaller than the cutoff and not discharging may actually want to obtain a permit regardless. And that is because there are two important protections that come with the no discharge permit. The first is called the agricultural stormwater exemption. Agricultural stormwater is not considered a discharge. An example of agricultural stormwater is runoff from a field following a storm. You don't need a permit to discharge agricultural stormwater, the runoff from a field during a storm. Also, return flows from irrigated agriculture are not considered a discharge. They are considered agricultural stormwater. Another protection provided by a permit is, is protection against major storm events. That is, the permit requires that the facility is designed and constructed and operated to contain all of the wastewater and the runoff from a 25-year, 24-hour storm event. A 25-year, 24-hour storm event is one that is so large that it's going to dump enough rain in a 24-hour period that statistically this is only going to happen once every 25 years. So a very rare, very large storm event. You're required as part of the permit to be able to contain wastewater and rainfall up to that limit. But if there's a storm beyond that limit and you discharge, if you have a permit and are abiding by that permit, you are protected. You cannot be found in violation of the Clean Water Act. 
If, on the other hand, you don't have a permit, you are vulnerable to charges of discharge in the event of these very large storm events. We're nearing the limits of my understanding of the law, so if this is something you're curious about, I can dig deeper with you. There's been a lot in today's lecture, so let me give you some of the keys, some of the things I think you really need to focus on. I need you to understand what a water of the United States is. I need you to be able to list several pollutants. I'd also like you to know who must get a permit according to the EPA. I'd like you to be able to determine if a farm is an AFO, and then if that AFO is a CAFO, and give examples. Also, I'll throw a little alphabet soup at you, NPDES, VPDES, VPA. And I'd like you to be able to describe those two protections that the permit gives you, the agricultural stormwater exemption and the 25-year, 24-hour rain event exemption. And that's all for today.